Hello everybody, this is Hans. Thanks for uh, joining. So I have uh, joined Logigear in 2001. I'm the CTO. I'm originally from uh, the Netherlands and I specialize mostly on uh, testing and uh, automated testing. So here is a couple of websites that you can look at, including my own Happy Tester website, uh, where you can find links to the articles that have uh, written, which kind of cover the things that we're going to talk about uh, today. So the title is Effective Testing with uh, Keywords. Particularly I will talk about uh, a method called action-based testing and I will talk about two of the products that we have that support that method which are called Test Architect and Test Architect for Visual Studio. Let me start off with uh, setting some rules. And you should only take that half seriously but it kind of sets the scene for uh, what we want to achieve. So the first rule of test automation is no more than 5% of all test cases should be executed manually. So that means that uh, about 95 you should be able to automate. I deliberately say test cases because what I'm talking about are the tests that you write down. Whether you write them down in a test management tool or in a spreadsheet or a Word document or the back of an envelope, that doesn't matter. But any test that you write down you should try to automate. So what, uh, uh, what is left is, uh, for example, exploratory testing. Exploratory testing means that you uh, sit behind your machine and just manually interact with the system and the test, which often reveals bugs that you didn't catch in your uh, test cases and in your automation. Especially when you do that with, uh, the two, with two of you pairwise, you will see that that's also a very effective way to find bugs. But that's not what we're going to talk about. We are going to talk about uh, the automation of tests. So the second rule is that you should be able to achieve that 95% with no more than 5% on average of your efforts. So you should not make it an automation project in which more than half of your team is uh, worrying about automation and getting tests to run. No, it should be that people focus on uh, designing, designing the test and designing better tests and the automation should be relatively easy even if there is a lot of changes in the system under test. So that is very uphill but that's deliberately. Now let's see uh, with the materials how far we can get. And the way we look at uh, automation medium is that you need to have three uh, components. First you need to have a good method and a good method means it's an integrated method for testing and automation. A good automated testing is not the same as automation of good manual testing. The fact that you're going to automate the test uh, has impact on how you design the test and how you organize the test. You, uh, you should really uh, uh, have an understanding when you create your test that they are going to be executed automatically. Also, in any method, I feel you need to have the testers in the driving seat. What I mean by that, it should not be the users, uh, it should also not be the developers that tell the tester what to do. The tester is a professional who should be able to think uh, out of the box and find bugs that everybody else overlooked. So the, the method needs to be very flexible allow you to use any technology that you need, not just the UI uh, interaction, uh, but it should also have minimal technical efforts. It should not be that uh, about half of all your efforts is about the automation and that you don't get around to do the testing. And of course maintainability is uh, a key success factor when you do automation. You do not want uh, bugs in your system under test, uh, sorry not bugs, but uh, changes in your system under test hold you up with your automation. Second is that you need a good tool uh, that supports that method. Of course we uh, feel that our tools are good but that's not the focus of this uh, little seminar. Uh, it should not be in the way of the automation engineers. So the automation engineers still need a lot of freedom to do their uh, magic. It should also encourage testers to follow the method. So it kind of it should ease you through the steps in the method and it should give you maximum manageability. Now even with those in place you still have to succeed in the three success factors 
success factor number one is test design. Uh, we'll talk about that, in, but that's the crucial one. Uh, of course, your automation. Uh, is it technically flexible enough? Uh, does it give you enough power to get to all your interfaces? And how you organize it, your project, your uh, stakeholders, uh, that, that uh, part is also very important. Let me first talk about keywords, keywords in general. There are roughly three different ways to do automation. And those ways are not necessarily mutually exclusive, but it's, it's good to organize it this way. By the way, if you want to read more about it, there is an excellent book from Dorothy Graham and Mark Fuster, which talks about these three methods in much more depth than I will do here. The idea about the first of those three is record and playback. The idea about record and playback is that you uh, do all the things that you want to do to the system and the test to perform your test manually. And you see that uh, manual test on there on the left side. You will click the buttons, uh, type the keys. You will uh, create some. All of that gets recorded in some kind of a script language. Depends a bit on which tool you use, what that script language looks like. And then the idea is, once you're done and you get the new version of your system under test, you just have to push the button and then all those tests will uh, run again. Now, in itself, record and playback is a nice feature, but uh, you should not expect too much miracles of it. The, you can already see when you look at this code, it doesn't look very readable and uh, very maintainable. And uh, it, it means that if there is a change in your system under test, you might end up with uh, a lot of changes in your uh, recorded test. And because they are so hard to maintain, you might not get around to do that, particularly when it happens towards the end of your uh, project. So record and playback is something to uh, what you could call handle with care. Now the second major uh, uh, method of automation is scripted automation. <coughs> in scripted automation, uh, a test design will create tests, for example in a Word document or in an Excel file or in a test management tool, and then will send these tests to an automation engineer, a specialized person, and sometimes I call him a, a navigator, uh, a specialized person who is going to automate those uh, test cases. And then of course Mr. Playback, the robot, will go ahead and uh, play it back. Compared to record and playback, uh, this method tends to be more successful. You uh, really have uh, specialized the automation task and giving it to people who uh, are technical, who understand uh, engineering principles and who can uh, obviously create some code. So it is much more organized and structured than record and playback would be. However, there is still uh, a lot of effort because you basically have two steps that take time. First, the test cases have to be written, and then they have to be automated. And you still create a lot of automation code, which you then have to maintain. Here is an example that I took from the internet. This is in a scripting language, uh, C Sharp. And C Sharp is used as a scripting language. And the framework that's used is called Coded UI. That is uh, released as part of Visual Studio 2010 and 2012 and is uh, in itself state-of-the-art automation. It's really very strong and uh, very powerful, particularly on uh, Windows environment, uh, Microsoft environments. But you can already see from this little piece of code that it is not so easy to understand. So if you're not technical, and many testers are not technical, if you're not technical, you will have a hard time understanding what is happening. Here. And even if you are technical, if you are an experienced coder, it will take, still take you some time. It is not that obvious what's going on. You need to be really into it and spend quite some effort to uh, understand this and to maintain this. If I come by and ask you what did you test and you show me this, that's not really going to be very good. So to, uh, to deal with that, uh, the keywords are introduced. And keywords, uh, we call that action-based testing because we call the keywords uh, actions. It is a method in which you uh, write your test with keywords, but you also modularize it. That means that you create modules, uh, sometimes I call them test clusters, but uh, modules 
that will uh, that you can use to organize your test. And this approach with this uh, with these modules and these keywords is particularly aimed at large and complex projects. If you have a small project, let's say 10 test cases, you probably don't have to worry about anything I say today. But if you have a bigger project, let's say thousands of test cases or even more, then uh, you definitely want to uh, find the best possible method and the best possible organization of your test. Now, action-based testing with its modules uh, t t tends to be very agile, even if you use traditional waterfall project. What it also does it uh, gives you a high level of automation quite easily. It is not very uh, difficult to achieve uh, the 95% or more automation that you're uh, looking for. Something that uh, has been done in many, many projects oh, uh, since 1994 when I uh, started with this approach. So, and it also, last but not least, it focuses on the test design. So it does not define the test automation as a very technical problem much rather uh, it focuses on, okay, so how do we organize our tests to be very automatable and to be very readable and manageable. And so here is what that typically looks like. And you have a, a, a small fragment here of one of those uh, test module. And each test module contains what we call test objectives that are just verbal statements and it contains one or more test cases. And then when you look at the bottom you see uh, a number of test lines, uh, those actions, each starting with an action keyword and a number of arguments. And so you should read that from top to bottom, which is also how the test will be uh, interpreted and uh, executed. And so in this particular test, we're going to introduce a new product in an uh, imaginary uh, warehouse system. And that product gets a new number, P9009. It is a sledgehammer, and we start out with five sledgehammers. Then we add 20 more sledgehammers. We add three more sledgehammers, and we add six more sledgehammers. And note that in this case, the, the product number is the identifying uh, field that we use to identify those uh, sledgehammers. Once that is done, we're going to check. Uh, uh, whether, how many sledgehammers we have. So we retrieve that information from the system. And then we compare it to what we call an expected value. So that 34 there is the expected value. And you still have to run the test to see it's the real value. Now, what you probably notice when I'm talking about this is that you can quite well understand this test. It's about products, it's about quantities. It's not such a big deal. The interesting part is, I have not shown you the system under test. System under test could be web-based, it could be Java, it could be C-sharp, it could be a legacy mainframe system, maybe even with a batch process, but it might also uh, maybe an app on your iPhone or on your Android uh, or the Windows phone. Uh, all of that is possible. And from the test, from this kind of a test, you cannot see. And that is an em enormous advantage, because it makes the test much more accessible to non-technical people, to uh, domain experts, testers, uh, who can focus purely on the business functionality. And then, uh, then you automate, not the test, but you automate the actions. And that's where those uh, automation engineers come in. And once you have automated an action, let's say at quantity, you can use it as many times as but it is automated only once. So the result is that if there is a change in your system under test, you only have to update that one action, then maybe two, maybe three, depends on the change, but then all your tests will run again, except of course when the, when the focus of the test is on that particular thing that you changed in your system under test. But if, it is, if the change is tangent, is not really part of that, uh, what you're testing here, and then you should be able to keep these tests uh, for a very long time without having to modify them. Now, one of the uh, examples I like to give is a mortgage system. Let's say you know that you're going to have a system that's going to test uh, home loans, mortgages. Then the only thing you have to do is look at your own home, find out wh how your mortgage works, and you can make test cases. You do not have to know what the screens look like, how many fields there are on a form, uh, whether to use SQL or any of that. That is something the automation engineer can worry about. 
Now, obviously, not all tests should be this high level. If you want to test uh, something uh, specific for the UI, like the, the structure of your menus or the items in a combo box, then, of course, you should make those actions a bit more what we call low level, so more close to the actual interface so that you can uh, worry about those uh, details. And you test a certain amount of details, uh, I would like you to show that in your test module. It should not be necessary for me to go into your script uh, for your action to know what you're actually doing. So when we zoom out a little bit, uh, what does a project look like in action-based testing? The first step is in test development plan in which you make what we call a high-level test design. And the main purpose of that is that you identify those test modules. So you're not going to develop them yet, but uh, that's uh, something you worry about later. But you are going to identify them. And uh, I like to compare that with uh, the chapters in a book. If you ever have written a book, you might know that the hardest part of writing a book is creating the contents. Once you have the table of contents, uh, the, uh, to actually write the book is still a lot of work, but it's a lot easier. So that's the same here. Once you have made that table of contents of your test modules, then uh, to actually create those individual test modules is uh, a much smaller, much more manageable project, sub-project uh, task to do. And obviously, you can make that part of a sprint when you are in a Scrum uh, environment. And for each test module, uh, the first thing you do is worry about the test objectives. So what is the scope of this test module? And what are then the, the, the things that we need to achieve in this test module? And then you will have one or more test cases uh, to kind of implement that scope, to address those, to address those test objectives. And mind you that with this approach, you do not start out with test cases. What you do is you start out with test modules, and then later in the process, uh, the test cases become like the outcome of your creative process. It becomes the, the test design that you do that uh, identify the test cases. And I see way too many projects out there that first make a list of test cases to be done, and then start implementing those test cases. And the result being that you, you don't have a lot of uh, degree of freedom anymore, creative freedom as a tester, meaning you will not find uh, good bugs. All of those test modules will use a set of actions that are stored separately, and uh, there is no such thing as a test module specific action. And then the automation will focus entirely on the actions. So there is no such thing as automating a test case. What you do is you automate the actions. And uh, for the technical people among you, uh, this is not such a big deal. Uh, actions are basically just function calls, but by putting them uh, with arguments, but by putting them separate from the scripting language into uh, an easy uh, spreadsheet-like format, uh, the whole process gets uh, improved a lot. So test design for me is most an effective test breakdown, what I just uh, talked about. So make sure that you have a bunch of test modules. Make also sure that each and every test module has a very clear scope, a very clear focus, so that you always know what is the idea of this test module. Why is it there? Is it because you want to test the insurance premium, or is it because you want to test the form with which the insurance uh, application is entered into the system? And then the second part is about the actions. Make sure that you use a high-level action if you can, but if it is, if the details of your user interface or any, anything else in your system is the focus of your test, then those actions should also be at a lower level. Uh, and so here is my statement. It is my belief the better you do this, the better you do that breakdown, the better you organize those actions, the more maintainable your test will be. So to be successful, and maintenance is like the most important part of an automation project. To be successful in that, uh, it does not matter so much the technology. Usually the tool will take care of. And uh, even if the, 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 it is not in the tool, it, uh, a particular technical challenge will be a very uh, boxed in, confined challenge. You have to worry about it, but you only have to worry about it once. While most of the time, you're worrying about the test design. 
Um, when I teach about test design, I like to introduce a concept which I call the holy grails of test design, the holy grails of test development. Uh, the, uh, I call them the holy grails because it is not so easy to achieve. You really have to look for them. But I feel the fact that you think about these things, the fact that you are looking for the grail, is more important than whether you actually find the grail. Uh, your, uh, your solution does not have to be perfect. As long as you have spent some time early in the project, and maybe with a couple of people in a room with a whiteboard, about those chapters, about how am I, uh, which test modules are we going to do in, in this project. Then once you have done that and you uh, get around to develop the project, the, the test module, that could typically be months later, then you need to worry about which test technique am I, am I going to use. Am I going to use decision tables or uh, state diagrams or soap opera testing or anything like that. And of course, who are the stakeholders? So uh, do I need to talk to the compliance department or uh, HR or uh, bookkeeping? Who, who am I going to get into the room? to talk about this particular test module and what is it that we need to test. And then of course, once you know uh, how you're going to do the tests, now you have to write them down. And in that sense, uh, at that moment you need to worry about what actions am I going to use. So that's where you make your decisions about actions, not, not any time before that. And also, what checks am I going to do? If I'm making an, uh, uh, a test, for example, for a premium calculation in an insurance, I do not also want to test the contents of the down box. That should be in a different test module. Because if you put too many detailed checks into a test module, you have to maintain them. So uh, when you change the, com the, the drop-down box, for example, in a combo box, or you add or delete items, you have to run the premium calculation test again, which might not be impacted by that change. So you really have to take care of that. One way I like to explain that when I teach about this is with garages. When uh, you come to America, to the United States for the first time, like I did in 2001, the first thing you notice is that a lot of people have garages. Something I can promise you uh, in the Netherlands where I come from, that is not the case. And the second thing you notice, people who put a lot of stuff in their garages except their cars. So the cars are still parked outside and the garage is full of stuff that is uh, unorganized and difficult to uh, keep track of. Now, when you look at the bottom two pictures, there are two different ways, but both of them achieve the same goal. Uh, the garage is much more organized, so now you have room for your uh, car. In case you're interested, the garage at the bottom right is my garage. That's where I live. And now, the, 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 uh, the question is, how do you get to that point of an organized garage or an organized house? And here is what you can uh, look at. First of all, you have to acquire the facilities. In other words, I had to go to uh, uh, the Home Depot, which in the U.S. is the, uh, the shop where you go for home improvement, for do-it-yourself. And I bought some cabinets and I built those cabinets. Then I went through my stuff. Uh, everything that I didn't need I uh, brought to charity so that I was only left with the stuff that I wanted to keep. And then the most important step is, okay, now where am I going to put it? And to my surprise I found that that's the difficult part. You really have to assign the shelves and to label the shelves. So where am I going to put my paint and where am I going to put my tools, uh, uh, my, my cleaning supplies, etc. Once you have done that, what I noticed is that it is really easy to actually clean up your garage. You just have to put it there. That is not the hard part. The hard part is to think about what am I going to put where. And what I also notice is that sometimes when you clean up, or, uh, you, you, you find something that you hadn't had the shelf for yet. So you might have to change. Uh, or you might have to have additional shelves or uh, additional labels. Now, when you bring that back to test design, I only later realized that that actually also applies to test design. It's the same problem. You have to label the shelves. You have to identify which test modules am I going to make. And you have to give them a clear scope and a clear description. Then afterwards to actually put the tests there, it's not such a big deal. That is quite doable and at least, even though the effort itself might take uh, quite a bit of skill, 
at least it's manageable. It is if you know that you have 65 test modules and you have uh, developed about 30 of them, you know you're almost halfway. Here is the list of criteria that I like to use when I do this. And what I typically do is I don't try to remember this. What I just do, I print this slide and put it on the wall when uh, we start doing test development. And I like two categories of criteria for uh, identifying test modules. First of all, there is the straightforward criteria, uh, which are the most obvious ones, uh, which you should basically always use. Like I uh, have the architecture of the system and the test. I have an application server, I have a database server, I have a web server. So let's test each and every one of those with a bunch of test modules. And of course, functionality. Is it about customers? Is it about the finances? Is it management information? That kind of functionality you want to uh, uh, to test with test modules, uh, administration, stuff like that. Of course, also matters what kind of test is it. Am I, t am I testing the navigation flow in my uh, UI? Or am I doing negative tests? Uh, am I interested in load and response? A functional test, that kind of questions, unit tests. And then there is what I call the ambition level. And which might be a little less obvious, but I feel very important. Because many of the tests that I see are relatively simple tests. They are just testing one functionality at a time, and uh, or sometimes even just a subset, and then that's called the smoke test, that you can run quickly to make sure your system is still okay. Uh, and most of those are just simple functional tests, uh, just for regression. Uh, that's fine, but of course it's not very aggressive. It's not what I call a high ambition level. So what I like to do in a test design is to allocate uh, a couple of test modules to what I call aggressive testing. In aggressive testing, you really try to break the system and the test. So you really try to apply something that I sometimes call jungle testing. And like in a jungle, unexpected things uh, jump on you. So in that approach, I like uh, uh, unexpected things to happen to my system and the test. Like a network connection goes down or uh, crashes or something like that. And then there are additional criteria, like uh, which stakeholders do I need to involve? If you know that you have a bunch of tests that you have to deal with HR, put those, make sure to put those in separate test modules so that you can create all the other test modules by yourself. You don't have to go to HR and you're not wasting HR's time with tests that do not matter for them. And another thing is if you have very complex tests, and like a premium calculation is a very complex test, keep that separate so that uh, for the other test it's more straightforward and easier to uh, create. Technical aspects also, if you have embedded software and then uh, and you want to, you have a couple of tests that specifically test the interaction with the hardware and then make sure to put those in a separate uh, uh, test module so that uh, the other tests don't suffer from it. And of course, there is project planning. If you know you have a bunch of sprints or you know that somewhere in uh, October you're going to define a bunch of uh, screens, a bunch of your application, make sure to put the tests for those guys into separate test modules so that you can wait with that until you get those details, until uh, the designers start designing those uh, forms. And while the more business-oriented test, you can uh, start right now. And Last but not least, risk. If you uh, designing software for an uh, for an airplane, and uh, some of those uh, tests are uh, business critical. If if the software fails, the the plane might crash. And so you want to make sure that you have some extra test modules allocated to make do more testing and more jungle testing, more advanced deep testing. And by identifying all of those test modules. You end up with a list of test modules, and then you can start prioritizing. Then you can talk to your management quite easily and find out which one to do first and which one can wait until there is a bit more time. And of course, you get a bit more time if you do good automation, because then you don't have to manually execute tests. So here is another high-level test. So the notice there is an initial part, and then there are some test cases, and then there is a final part. And what I typically like to do in a test module is to create a flow that goes from the beginning of the test module to the end. So I start the system, then I rent a car, rent another car, check a payment, 
and maybe do a couple more uh, test cases, and then I close down the application. And the focus is on readability. And this, this test, for example, it's quite clear. I'm renting cars and I'm checking a payment and still haven't shown you the system under test. Even stronger, from this test you cannot even tell whether it's automated or not. You could easily uh, execute this test manually, as long as you know what to do when you rent a car. Yeah, you can just go ahead and do it by yourself and not w even worry about the automation. From the test you cannot see, and that's a very good uh, thing to have. And so navigation details like menus and drop-down boxes, you will typically avoid them unless they are the of your test. If you want to make sure the OK button works, then you have to put it in your test. Otherwise, I don't want to see it. And that is also true for the kind of fields that you uh, don't really care about. Uh, the, which city did you rent a car in? Which state? You, you don't really care for this test, so you don't uh, list it. If the state where or the city where you rent it would have an influence on the cost, uh, on the payment, then you do need to see it. So that is the, the consideration that you have to do. Now here is an example of a lower level test uh, where you actually uh, check whether the new order button works. I click uh, in the main window on a control that we have baptized uh, new order and then check whether the window new order exists. N notice that uh, when we do things like click and check window that we use logical names, what we call logical names, natural names for the controls. So the internal, uh, the control itself might not even have a name might have a very uh, long caption, like uh, uh, start new order or something, uh, 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 but when you give it a logical name, a natural name, it's easier to read, but also if that button gets a different caption, then you, can, you don't have to change your, uh, your test, not even the low level test. So we did a project in the past, I was actually involved in that project, where things didn't go very well. We had 650, te 650 test modules with over a million lines and initially there was not a lot of attention to test design. The result of that was that uh, the tests were very difficult to maintain. And why did that happen? Because uh, uh, not known to me, the, st the customer had told the team to test everything in detail in every test module. So all the test modules were uh, way too detailed. And it typically would look like this. And the, the, the purpose of this particular section, and starting with key navigate until the last line get, uh, is to get the initial sequence number for a teller transaction. And tellers are the people that are behind the, the desks uh, helping customers. And so they need to be emulated to test. So, but to do that, you need to know what the sequence number of the next transaction is going to be. So you have to go through a search dialog to get that. Now you can probably already see that this is not an easy to read sequence of events. And it is very dependent on details of your system under test. If that, uh, that key uh, F7 becomes F8, this test won't run anymore. And uh, they, if you do something like check breadcrumb, uh, that is that little line that you see on top of the screen telling you where you are, if that uh, search changes into find, you have to go back to all your tests where you use these lines to, uh, to adapt it, while it was not the target of this test. So why don't you just go and do it like this? You put it in a high level action, get sequence, in that high level action you still do that entire sequence, but now you, uh, you abbreviate it into one action. Now, not only do you immediately see what this action apparently is doing, and we're assigning a variable, and the greater than, greater than symbol is what we use to uh, define an assignment. Not only can you see it immediately, but also it is not dependent on details anymore. If the F7 becomes an F8, uh, this guy doesn't care. So since you need a uh, sequence number at the beginning of just about every test module in that project, uh, that's going to save you big time, uh, which we ended up doing. We went. Uh, back to the 650 modules, we redesigned them with much more of these high-level actions and the test became a lot more maintainable, even uh, a million test lines. 
what it also means for the tooling is that you focus a lot more on your test development. The success of your automated test project is being made or broken in the test development, not in the technology, in the automation. So most of the tools, the most of the tool suites out there uh, are good tool suites, but they focus on only the test management, or actually I would call it test case management, and on the automation, the playback. And uh, so but most, uh, mostly you will see a test management tool and a playback tool. While the tooling that uh, I would like to recommend, including our own tooling, will focus much more on that test development. That is what you should look at. That is what the tool should do for you. The fact that the tool also has powerful automation, powerful test management is still nice to have, but it's not why you're doing it. You're doing it because of test development. So that is what you uh, need to do. And that, uh, that is the reason for being for test architect. And when we started with this, we didn't have a tool, but we started developing this tool because we were not happy with the existing tools. They didn't really help us enough with the test management. So let me show you products that we have. One is uh, Test Architect, we, we call that now the regular Test Architect, which brings its own test management and automation. For example, you can see a record button and a playback button and there are interface identifiers and viewers. So there is a lot of automation and you see there is, uh, there is a lot of test management going on with a tree which not only stores the test modules, but in the test modules also the test cases. And it will also show the actions and data sets and pictures and stuff like that. But the focus of the tool is on that test development. So you see the test module here uh, with those rent car, rent car, rent car, and the start application. It lists the, the objectives of this test module. And besides the editor that you see, there are other tabs like uh, information and test cases, stuff meant to manage this test module. So the test management is kind of built into the test development in a uh, much smoother way. And uh, let me also show you the other uh, variation, which is architect for uh, Visual Studio, uh, which we have developed about a year ago, actually at the request of Microsoft. What it uh, uh, does, it extends Visual Studio with this keyword module, so that you can do the same thing in uh, Visual Studio. And this is really meant to fit into the Microsoft ecosystem. So it will also interface with Microsoft Test Manager. Uh, it is based on Coded UI, that is that scripting language that you saw earlier. But uh, while Coded UI is doing the actual work, you can see this is much more readable than that uh, Coded UI uh, fragment and it comes with its own little toolbar. It actually does also have a recorder, and the output of that recorder is not going to be coded UI, it's going to be actions. So when you record something, it will end up in the test module for the, with actions. Now, the structure of how the tests are built up and the actions uh, typically goes like this. You start with test modules, all of those use those actions are either in, uh, implemented in something like we call action definitions. I will show you in a moment what that looks like. And then, or you just program them yourself in a programming language. And uh, th these low-level actions can either be built in to Test Architect, which is typically uh, a lot of them. We have hundreds of those in Test Architect. But you can also create them yourself. All of those are controlled by an interface mapping mechanism, which we call interface definitions. I will show you a quick example later on, so that you shield the, the details of your user interface from not even the tests, but also those action implementations. And let me use this, uh, this application as an example. It's a music player, it's not a real one. We just created it for uh, the demos and uh, teaching. But what you can do is you have a tree of artist songs, you can click on a song and then it will show you information about that song, like uh, the bit and the file type, etc. And this is made in WPF so that we can use it in both our products. And then a uh, typical test module uh, could look like this. I click on the tree node 
and the slashes here are to uh, distinguish between the notes. So the music, Miles Davis, so what? So that would bring me from music, Miles Davis, and would click this particular note. And uh, the action will also expand the tree if necessary. And then you check those fields. So we check the title, title the artist, and the bit rate with uh, the values. Actually, these, these are the wrong values from another test, but you will find out soon enough. Um, now let's make that that low-level test. Uh, these are typical low-level actions, so this is just testing the user interface. Let's see if we can package that into a higher-level action. So the name of the action is going to be check the bit rate, and then it has three arguments: an artist, a song, and an expected value for the bit rate. As my bit rates are 128, we use that as the default value, and so that we don't have to specify it anymore. Then the in the in the action definition within itself is also a little spreadsheet. We're going to go ahead and do two of those low-level actions, and one of them is click tree note, and we just compile, and with an expression we compile those arguments together. And the pound sign in our tool means this is an expression, a formula. So it starts out with a hard-coded text uh, music because that's the root of the tree. Then we uh, uh, the ampersand concatenates and adds the strings. So it uh, it adds the artist name, and then it will add the slash, and then it will add the song title. And so it will click that note, and then it will check the bitrate field, and then the pound sign says the expected value should be that 128 for example. And then your test becomes a lot more readable. So check bitrate, check bitrate. Now this test is no longer the dependent interface, and whether you do it through the tree in the fields, or whether you just make an SQL query to check this in the database, or you do it, uh, you send a message, a SOAP message to a web service, it doesn't matter. You cannot see, and you don't want to see, because you're a tester. You're just interested in the value. Of what you can also do is you can go a level down, for example, in Python or C Sharp or Java, and you can actually implement the, the, the an action like check sort order with a function. So you get the, the, the window, you get the control, and then you loop through the table, and the control is the table. You loop through the table, and you just check, and when you get in cell from the table, you just check whether that is going up, if it's going down, and then we have to say that it failed. So this is also the way to implement an action, and this is typically what you do if the action is uh, too complicated for just a simple definition. And uh, an action with a loop in it, like this, you, you want to do it in programming language. And you can map that uh, check sort order function to uh, an action, which you could call check sort order, uh, and you can give it arguments, and you can run this uh, action. By the way, I'm just going through this fairly quickly. There is uh, a lot more information in the in the tool. There's a tutorial built in where, where you can read more of this. And of course, you can always ask questions as well. So the interface mapping, let me run that by you real quick. This is a very important step in your automation process. So by the time you have created your test modules and uh, you start doing the actions, interface definition is really important because it uh, defines how sensitive your automation is going to be for uh, changes in the UI. And uh, especially user interfaces, graphical user interfaces, are the, uh, the items that change the most and that have the most impact on the test. So you really want to kind of uh, box that off into a separate uh, file. And this is not unusual for test automation, but the point is not the technical part of it. The point is that you think about it, that you really pay attention, and this is a design product. You should not just uh, do whatever your uh, recorder uh, generates. So I'm nearing the end of my uh, my presentation. Uh, some tips how you get that automation more stable. So now we have actions, we are implementing them. What, what should you do? First of all, when you implement an action, and so let's say you're an automation engineer, make sure to test that action before you actually let testers run that action. So you should make some test modules of your own. And an action is also a software product, so it needs to be tested. What you should also do is work with your develop developers that they use 
things like accessible name or ID and web browsers uh, to identify your controls so that you don't have to do that difficult work of uh, mapping yourself. Um, use active timing. With that I mean you do not hard code at sleeps. So you do not say white five, uh, wait five but you wait until the table is, pop is populated. Let's say that you have a table to populate. And here again you should talk with your uh, developers to provide you some hooks. Let's say that table, let's say you have a table of uh, on average 500 lines that is on your screen and that's populated from a database. You have to wait until the table is finished populating before you can uh, uh, count the rows or something like that. So why don't you go ahead as developer and disable that table control until it is done? And that disable enable property is something that a test tool can see. So you can just wait in your test tool with a waiting loop until you uh, see that going enabled and then you can retrieve your value. So this is very important in just about every project that I've seen. Timing, uh, besides the interface definition, timing is one of the biggest factors in failures of your uh, automation. Now here are some other things that you can do. Most of all, uh, keep an eye on your test design. If you notice that it's difficult to run your tests, figure out if you haven't, if you're not running those tests too early in the life cycle. Maybe you should test the low-level functionality first. Here is an example in .NET of that identifying property. So you have properties like accessible name that a developer can easily populate, but he or she will probably only do that if you ask. If you don't ask, uh, the person might not do it because it's just uh, uh, what's the point if the user cannot see it. But because the user cannot see it and you and the tester can, you can use it to uniquely identify that control. Now, when you have actions and when you have keywords, you can also use something called data-driven test. Uh, these pound signs, they, uh, they can uh, uh, identify variables and they can lead into variables that you can get from a uh, table. Uh, either you program that yourself or uh, in the case of test architect that's built in to the tool and then you just repeat that data set until you're done with the rows in the table. Now last but not least uh, on the automation. Uh, automation is not necessarily UI automation. There are plenty of tests that I've seen in which in the same test module hidden under the action some of them actually go to the UI, while others just go to the database with SQL. Uh, it's easy to compile SQL queries in uh, in your navigation, uh, or go through a SOAP protocol or a REST protocol, uh, or the, the uh, access methods in components in uh, OSGI or anything like that. So that's quite doable. Also, uh, to take that a step further, if you have embedded software, and not only in smartphones where where we uh, have that available, but also, for example, point of sales uh, systems or uh, car diagnostic systems uh, or uh, medical equipment. We have done stuff like that as well. What you always do is you keep your agent in the device small. You do as much work as possible in the host so that that agent does not have to be uh, maintained too much. So. Let's say a few words about how you organize this in a project. It is good to understand, even in an agile project, that you have different products for the different types, uh, for the different activities. So your system development activity obviously has a lot of products, particularly the software that is being developed. The test development has the test modules as its product, uh, as its main product, and the automation has the actions as its product. So all of those have their own life cycle. And then from a project point of view, depending on whether you're waterfall or uh, uh, agile, you're going to uh, connect them together, which is indicated by those dotted lines. But conceptually, you need to uh, understand that these are different product life cycles. I talked about that 5% automation effort, and uh, that is when you talk at test development, the effort is usually pretty smooth. You you in test long as you have room to do that. While the automation is a bit more bumpy. 
uh, it starts out with uh, a lot of time to set up infrastructure to learn about the tool and the method and then probably there is some quiet time then you start implementing actions there might be some technical problems so you uh, you get busy and then it goes back to quiet so on average it will be yeah, five percent but that five percent can have peaks and valleys one slide I have uh, on Agile, uh, this is how you can sp uh, fit this in, for example, in a Scrum project. And you keep track of your overall test design, uh, but then for each sprint, you start out with test development uh, right away. You keep those tests at roughly the same level of detail as your user stories and domain understanding and acceptance criteria, etc. Uh, so you don't go too low level later on in the sprint uh, you might make what I call interaction test modules that uh, you and then of course there is the automation uh, and the execution and then when you are successful you, in my view you should be able to do that before the end of the sprint get everything tested and automated if you achieve then in the next sprint you can start both reusing the tests uh, as a regression test and you can use the, reuse the automation Thank you very much and here are some websites that you can look to and uh, the, the bottom line is keywords is one of the techniques for automation in addition to other techniques. I feel by the way that, uh, that keywords is a must when you have either agile or big projects but they are not a silver bullet. You really need a method uh, that I talked about, about test design and holy grails etc. You really need a method to make it successful. And you need to organize it very well. You need to know when to do what and who to involve. And uh, you need to uh, have your skills. You need to understand your testing techniques, your tools. It is much more than just using keywords. Okay. I hope you enjoyed this uh, talk.